Bibles with me to Galatians, and uh, that is spelled with A's, Galatians, not Galatians, Galatians. All right, chapter 6 is where we're going to pick up, and we're going to start in verse, uh, I'm gonna actually going to start in verse, um, I'm going to go ahead and start in verse 9. And uh, we'll read that verse. It says this, Galatians 6, 9 says this. It says, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't, come on, everybody say it, give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. And we thank you for your word, God. We thank you that it is living and it is active, God, this morning. I thank you that your word never, Lord, it never uh, goes out and God never accomplishes what it's sent out to do, Lord. Your word always falls on hearts that are willing and able to live out that word. And so, Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. God, I thank you this morning for every life here, every purpose, every situation, every destiny, God, that lays in this room. We thank you, God, this morning for your purpose to be awakened in all of our hearts this morning. We thank you. Lord, that we would be able to live out our lives for you. Lord Jesus, we thank you, uh, Lord, that we wouldn't give up. God, that we would press through and uh, that we would lay hold of what you have for us. And uh, Lord, pray more than anything, you'd be more famous this morning than you were yesterday. And if you believe that, say amen. Amen. So uh, this passage of scripture, to put it in context, is talking about actually a seed. It's talking about that the concept of that, that when you put a seed in the ground, that there is this period called time, and most of us hate that. Most of us hate that time period called thing, that, that thing called time to get what? Harvest, right? So you put a seed in the ground in the natural, and over the course of time, which is called our middle, right, which causes frustration and irritation, and then what happens if you can wait and not pull that seed out of the ground, what happens? Harvest comes. And I think that what we have to do is look at our lives and say, okay, am I willing to endure time for harvest? This is what Jesus is saying. He's implying, he's using this as a, a I mean, how many farmers we got in here? Right, exactly. So this wouldn't really be real relevant for us as non-farmers. But, but the concept is still the, is still the same, that there is the process of putting a seed in the ground, having to wait, and then out of that waiting period comes God's promises, right? And so I, as I begin to think about that, I begin to think about a picture. And, and most of us have seen pictures from where you have to go through a dark room, right? And, and you take the picture, you put it in the dark room, and then it sits there for a certain amount of time. And then in that process of, of being in the dark room, this picture comes alive. What you couldn't see before actually becomes an actual thing that you can see, and then you come out of that dark room, and then you can literally take that picture and show everybody what it is, right? And what, what am I telling this story for? What I'm telling the story for is because I want you to understand is that your life is that picture, and that how long you're willing to stay in that dark room of process determines whether you're really going to be able to share your story or not. And a lot of times, see, I can go and show you a picture, and I can tell you a story based on the picture. But if I don't allow the picture to be fully developed, I rob you of the story that I have. And so many of you have a story to be told, but you're unwilling to go through the process of letting it be developed in you so you can show others what your story is, that you can, that you can show them the goodness and the power of Jesus working through your life. Every one of you have a story in here this morning. Some of you haven't went through the process of time to get the story. Some of you have avoided the process and you don't have a story. But God is simply saying in this text, so let's not get tired of doing what's good. How many of you are tired of doing good constantly watering the garden every day, going out, putting water on the garden, looking at it, going back, and all you see is dirt? I mean, you see dirt long enough, you say, I'm done with this. Like, everybody else has got tomatoes and cucumbers and watermelon and squash, and they got all this stuff. But that's their harvest. That's not yours. And that's the problem is we've been looking at too many other people's harvests and trying to compare them to ours, but you just put your seed in the ground, and you're wondering why haven't you gotten the harvest. 
Well, you just put the seed in the ground. There's this thing called time. And if you don't embrace the process of time, you rob yourself of a harvest. And so he's saying here, so let's not get tired of doing what's good. Now, what I want to do is I want to break this down into a a different context and in a different um, version. And this is the amplified version. It's louder. That's why it's called amplified. Not really. It says this, and let us not lose heart. And grow weary and faint and acting noble and doing right. For in time and at the appointed season, who, what time is it? Appointed. How many of you know that every one of you have an appointed time? But we want to be on our time clock. We want to be on, on what we think it should be. But it, there's an appointed time for you. Such a time. Had, had he- Esther been born 20 years prior she would have been irrelevant for her destiny. And so many of us, we, are, we, under, we don't understand. We were born for such a time as this. And this season, for such a time as today. And we wish, we, we, try to, we try to force God into doing something. But God ultimately knows everything. You have an appointed time. Can you embrace the appointed time? And then he goes on and it says this, and at the, at the appointed time, we shall what? Reap. So waiting, the byproduct of waiting is reaping. If you can wait, you can get. If you can't wait, you don't get. And it's a, it's a simple biblical principle that if you can wait, you can get. If you can't wait, you don't get. And a lot of us aren't waiting, and so we're not getting, and so we go and get it from something else. Now I'm preaching. And we get it from something other than God. And we wonder, why aren't we getting the byproduct that we thought it would get? Because you're not getting it from God. Well, I thought this relationship would work out and it's not going so well because you got it outside of God's timing. You can have the right thing in the wrong time and it not work out too well. And then it goes on and says, if we do not loosen and relax our what? Courage and faint. What's the point? See, what happens is if you, if you let yourself get tired of doing what's good, you rob yourself of an assignment. So, so here's the point. Don't allow a season that you're going through to define your assignment. That there is an assignment that you are called to regardless of what season you're in. See, a lot of times we think because we're going through hard times, now we don't have to do anything good for God. Or now we don't have to do this we, we can well this because we're in the middle of a dark season. We can put our lives on pause for everybody else. How have you know that when you're having a bad day and you're going through Walmart, people are not your priority, right? Because when you're going through a bad day, everybody else should have a bad day. Am I preaching? Right? I'm going to make sure everybody knows that I'm having a bad day so they can come and pamper me instead of me being a blessing to somebody else because I know what I'm going through and I don't want somebody else to have to go through what I'm going through. That's what the passage is saying is don't grow weary and well-doing. Don't stop being Christ-like because you're going through something. Go ahead and continue to be Christ-like. And in that, you're watering your seed and you'll get to see a harvest. See, so many of us are cursing our middle and God is in the middle of in your life and he's doing something. He's watering your harvest, your seed while you're out loving on other people. You're wondering, why aren't I getting blessed? Why aren't I, why, why aren't I getting what I thought I should get? You just keep doing the good that God's called you to and let God water your garden while you go water somebody else's. See, the middle... At the end of the day, we'll do one of two things. It will steal your passions or it, will rep- it or, or it will purify them. You find out in the middle of when everything isn't going right, what you really value, what you really love, and what you don't love. In the middle, you realize, wow, I really don't like God as much as I thought him, as much as I thought. And that's a sobering thought. Some of you all have had that thought, man, I'm going through this. I don't really love God like I thought I did. Why? Because your love for God was conditional. And sometimes we need to go through the middle for that to be exposed in our lives so that we can realize, wow, I've been serving God based on conditions. And I need to change how I view my 
my love for God. See, or you realize that even in the middle of going through a mess, I still love kids. I still love people. I still love. And what it does is it reconfirms your passion. So sometimes you need the middle because all it does is it helps, it helps put some things in alignment. It helps clarify some things in your life. Amen. I think a lot of times we look at why we're going through certain things as if this thing that God has got against us, when you don't understand that the, the, the thing that God is doing in you is for you way more than you may realize it. I mean, there are things that Alicia and I parenting Jaylee are doing for her right now that she doesn't like, and it's for her sake, right? How many of you know you are a child of God? That God is doing things in you to help you get to your destiny because he wants you to stand before him and him being able to say, well done, good and faithful servant or son or daughter. Who just snorted? <laughs> I'm just kidding. But it, right, that, like, I think that right now some of our, some of our passions need to be purified. Some of our things that we put it so high on the, on, on our life scale of what we, what we think is successful needs to be put through the fire. Right? The Bible says that he will purify gold. He purifies gold. So gold is valuable. Why would gold need to be, why would gold need to be put through the fire? Because there's impurities in it. And some of us need to know some of those impurities that are in our hearts, that are in our minds, that are in our actions, that are in our reactions. And until we go through that middle, that fire, that process, sometimes we don't know what's really in us. There are things that as your little preacher up here preaching didn't know that was in him until he went through the middle. Didn't know that until he went through the fire. There were things in me like, what, preacher? This pulpit doesn't make you pure. It's his presence that makes you pure. Always remember, it's in his presence. That is what refines you. That is what makes you who you're going to be. You need his presence way more than you need anything. And being in the middle sometimes is the only thing that can get you to his presence. There have been times where everything, you know, that there's the saying that there is nothing that, that robs future success like current success. And sometimes the only way to get you out of your current success and to realize who's bringing the success is for a middle stage. It's for you to have to go through something to understand something. See, it's the harvest you plant in others that you will get through the season you're waiting in. The season that you're getting, I wonder if we would just take the same energy of wonder. Why, God? The questions and all the... Look, I'm not saying you don't question God and you don't... He's a big God. He can handle your questions. But at the end of the day, I don't want to spend all of my energy wondering why I'm going through something when I could be loving on some people. I have found that I get more answers from God in loving people than I do wondering why I'm in where I'm in. I found out that if I just love on somebody, sometimes the answer is in that love. See, the middle will allow you to find a compassion or resentment from others. See, this middle, you will resent people because they're not in the middle. Their lives are going great. Everything looks good. Or you'll find compassion because you understand what they've had to go through. You understand that what you're going through now, they are going to have to go through. They may have to go through at some point in their lives. At the end of the day, the middle was for you. The middle is for God to do something in and through you. It goes on and it says this, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. How many of you are tired of doing what's good? How many of you have really, if you're really honest, you're tired of loving people that haven't been loving you. You're tired of showing up to church and your situation stay the same. If we can get real this morning. How many of you are tired of loving on those other people while you're in the middle of a situation that's difficult? 
I know I've been there. I know that I've struggled in that mindset to say, you know what? Why should I love on them? I'm going through this. And you know what that is? Is That's looking at self. That's you looking at you thinking that it's all about you. How many of you know that this world isn't about you? Jesus died for all the world. He didn't die for you and you alone. Now, I know we say that to you, but he died for the whole world. He would have died for just you, but he died for the world. And sometimes we need the middle to recalibrate us that it's not about just me and my life and my family and my world. That there is a world that's hurting and broken and culture is lying to them. And the world is telling them that this is how you can get satisfied and this is how you can succeed. And this is what it looks like. And if the church would rise up and be Jesus on the earth, I wonder how different things would be. See, I think the middle creates this desire to be available to others. How many of us are available to those around us? I, I know for me that when I'm going through something, sometimes the, the, the greatest thing I can do is get around somebody else and hear their story. Have you ever had that, you know, you've been, man, I'm going through this and going through this. This is one good thing about social media. You complain and you complain about your situation, and then all of a sudden you see this image, this picture that goes through your social media and, and you look at it and you say, wow, I, this is nothing. I'm going through nothing compared to these people. These people are believing God for their child to survive and to live. And I'm wondering if I am going to be able to have a nicer car. See, that is the reality of the middle. Sometimes that middle recalibrates. Life isn't as bad as you think it is. Then it goes on and it says this, at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Now, the second point I want to throw at you is, is something in, there's something that happens in a seed that as the seed's planted and you water it, right, there are a lot of things that are happening under the ground that you don't see. There are things that are happening that you're like, man, is this seed even, is this really real? But you know what the Bible says about a seed? That it must go into the ground and first die. And then it, it, it begins to produce. And sometimes the middle kills some wrong ambitions in our lives. Kills some things that are wrong and distorted. And then revives some new things. So what my point is, is this, is a lot of times if we were to just constantly see external things happening in our lives, we would say, man, we are spiritual. We are spiritually progressing in our lives. Man, I mean, look at this. I mean, I watered, I put the seed in and it popped right up. And what would it matter if you put a seed in the ground, it came right back up and then died the next week, right? That's what a lot of us, we want to see external things in our lives because that's what defines spiritual progress, But can I let you know that this morning that spiritual progress isn't assured by external improvements. It's by internal discernment. And what do I mean by internal discernment? What I mean is that spiritual progress, God sometimes will have us in this middle to learn his own voice. That that it doesn't matter how you're really growing on the outside when you're growing on the inside. When John 10.10 10 becomes alive and you hear the voice of God louder than you've ever heard him. And the things that he's speaking to you in the middle, you're becoming more aware of his voice. That is spiritual progress. Spiritual progress isn't about, about the things that you may see on the outside of your life. But also, oftentimes, we want to see progress, right? Like if we go to the gym, we need to start seeing some, some results. But what may be happening when you're in the gym is a mind shift may be happening that all of a sudden, I'm actually going to start taking care of my body. And long before you actually see the weight come off externally, you are just seeing something happening on the inside of you. This is what happens is when you begin to do what is right, things begin to shift on the inside sometimes before they begin to shift on the outside. But so many of us are governing what we're going to do and how we're going to serve God based on what's happening on the outside of our lives. And if we would begin to look on the inside, we may begin to see something a little different on 
on our lives, we may begin to see that God is doing something way more significant than what we may be even aware of. See, God is in the middle as much as he is in every other season. I think we think God is void of our lives when we're in this dark place. God, he left because it's dark. But it, when you're on the, on the mountaintops and you're seeing Jesus do all these crazy things and these miracles in your life, you think, God is with me today. Right? But when you're in the valley and it's real quiet and there's nobody in there and you're all alone, you think that God has left you. But I want to assure you this morning that God is with you in the beginning, God is with you in the middle, and God is with you on the mountain. That God is with you in every season of your life. And so many of us have said, God, you left me. Church, God never leaves his children. Come on, look at somebody this morning and tell them he never leaves his children. And somebody needs to hear that this morning. Somebody needs to know that Jesus has not left you because you're in the middle of a season. See, the stage in your life causes you to search and, 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 and to discover and allow God to awaken some things that have been dormant. Sometimes the middle will cause you to go back to your life and say, what is this life all about? Man, I got caught up in coming to church. I got caught up in lifting my hands and not even having anything change in my heart. Oh, now I'm preaching, right? Because, see, it's not about you coming and giving an offering if you can't give it in your heart. See, we get to this place where we go through these motions and these things, but sometimes the middle will recalibrate the heart on the inside of you. You need the middle way more than you think you need it. We don't like it, but we need it. It is God's grace and mercy on your life that you get to go through stuff. I know that is a quiet church this morning on that one. It's the truth. Because there are things that there are things that have been awakened on the inside of you because of the middle. Do you know most entrepreneurs have become entrepreneurs not because of what was in their hearts, but because of what they had to go through? And as they went through something, they dug down deep inside of them and said, There is something that God has called me to. There is something that is inside of me that I need to let the world know about. And what I'm saying is this, is that there are things that need to be awakened on the inside of you. And sometimes you've got to go through a dark season in your life to understand that there is something that God is wanting to birth through you. Can I tell you that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they went through that fire, that the God that they served prior to that fire, that that nation served was Nebuchadnezzar. The God that they served after the fire was God, the Lord, Jesus And sometimes you going through your middle will change what other people worship. Oh, come on, somebody. That God will shift a nation because of what you're willing to do and what what you're willing to go through. I should have got way more amens than that, but that's fine. Hey, thank God we're not on that. See, sometimes, by the way, this sermon title is called Underdeveloped. Because I think that many of us think we're way more developed than we are And we think that God should be giving us things that we can't handle. And we are way less undeveloped than we realize. And we're saying, God, why aren't you giving me the nations? God, why aren't you letting me start my own church? God, why aren't you? Because you're underdeveloped. God, why won't you let me start that business? God, why won't you? Why won't you? And God says, because I love you. And I don't want you to get crushed because your character isn't there yet. Your integrity isn't there yet. Your willingness to be generous isn't there yet. See, sometimes we are undeveloped for the next season. So God, in his grace and in his love, steps in and requires you to go through the middle. Right now, you may be going through the middle and you are looking at God and you are cursing him and you are mad and you are bitter at God. And God is simply loving you and he's trying to help you become developed. And guess what? God's God's love will carry you through it. God's love will get you through it. See, it's actually in the middle where you realize that God at the end of the day has been in every season of my life. Wow, God, you were actually, it's, 
it's interesting. I can look back at some of those middle things in my life, and I'll have another one whenever God chooses, whenever that season happens. But you know what? I always walk out of those areas in my life, and I always look back, and I say, thank God for what you did there. I've never gone through a dark time in my life and been able to look back and say, what the heck? That was for nothing. I've always been able to look back if my heart is right. Let me put that up there. If my heart is right and see what God did through it. The thing that he did in me. The thing that he wanted to do through me. And if it wasn't for me going through that, I wouldn't be who I am today right now preaching to you. And man, I am who I am because of what I was willing to go through and embrace. You are who you are based on what you're willing to go through and embrace. What I'm trying to say is stay in the middle if you're called to the middle right now. Don't try to, don't try to, I've never seen a mom or a dad who's had a preemie baby tell the doctor, get the baby out of the incubator. Have you ever seen that? No. Why? Because the doctor knows what the doctor's doing. He knows what's best for the baby. And so many of us are like, we need to pull our destiny out of this thing. And we need to pull our purpose. We just need to go move on. God's saying, trust me, it needs to stay here and get developed. You know, I was thinking about this as I was, as I was writing this sermon. I was thinking about Jaylee. And our daughter is like this adventure queen that thinks she can climb the top of the house and jump off the roof and stuff like that already. And I'm like, you're two, girl. Like, you just need to chill. And there are things, as I begin to see, as I begin to really think about this, there are things that I'm restricting Jaylee from that she has the strength for, but she doesn't have the understanding for. And you see, God is possibly restricting you from things that you're strong enough for, but you're underdeveloped to fulfill, that you don't have the understanding for. And you think that God doesn't like you. You think that God isn't for you. And God is doing the same thing that me and Alicia do for Jaylee. And we're holding her back from things that she's strong enough to do, but she's not wise enough to do. She's strong enough to drive a car, but church, I don't think you want me to give her the keys to your vehicle. <laughs> no, I said yours uh, on purpose. <laughs> Daddy knows. And so what, what can we do if we're in the middle? What's the most spiritual thing you can do? Can I tell you what it is? It's found in Psalms chapter 27, verse 14. It says this. It says, here's what I've learned through it all. You need to listen when it says that. It says, don't give up. Isn't that amazing how that ties in? To Galatians 6. The one thing I've learned through it all. Don't give up. Don't be impatient. Be entwined as one with the Lord. Be brave. Be courageous. And never lose hope. Yes, keep on waiting. For he will never disappoint you. I mean, let's just wrap this up. You all, some of you all need to get that scripture and you need to put it on something and you need to remind yourself that, that I am going to wait on the Lord. Embracing the process of waiting produces God's promises. That is in essence what he's saying. That if you will embrace the process of waiting, God's promises are on their way. And many of us aren't seeing God's promises because we're stepping out of the season before it's time and we're shriveling up and we're messing our lives up because we won't embrace the season of waiting. I mean, Lord Jesus, we know we don't have to wait for coffee anymore. We don't have to wait for food anymore. We don't have to wait for for anything anymore if we don't want to. If you've got enough money, you don't have to wait for anything. But that should have never bled into the church. And what we've allowed is we've allowed the culture outside, we've allowed McDonald's to determine what we do spiritually in our lives. We've allowed, well, McDonald's gives us food quick. Why doesn't God give us food quick? Because God has something way better than a soy burger for your life. And if you're going to be satisfied with a hamburger from McDonald's, then so be it. You can have it. But God has something so much better for you than that. So go ahead and keep waiting. 
Go ahead and keep waiting for God to give you what he wants to give you and stop thinking that he's robbing you from a season and robbing you from stuff when God's got a promise and he's got a destiny and he's got a purpose for your life. And that if you will embrace this process of waiting, God's promises are on their way, church. God's promises, God, you see, God works from the end to the beginning. And if you're not in your season and God is working towards you and you're working away from him, how can he ever get you your promise? That is so good. Let me tell you something else about the middle, about the waiting. And this is this, is that the middle is one of the greatest teachers on spiritual stewardship you'll ever learn. Some of us are so mature when it comes to certain things. We can, we can budget our finances. We can, we can put our clothes in color coordinate things in our closets. But you can't wait on God for nothing. And then one of the most important things you need to learn is spiritual stewardship. Because in spiritual stewardship is everything else that you need to learn. See, if you learn to steward this season, all the, other, all the other seasons will be influenced by it. Think about that. The season that you're in right now, if you can steward it, it determines every other season. Right? It allows you, right now, I was literally talking to Alicia about Christmas. I was like, man, we got to get, we got to make sure we have a des- area for a Christmas tree. And I'm already thinking about Christmas right now in the middle of summer because it's hot. But you know why I can, inc- I can enjoy Christmas? Because I know it's coming. I just got to deal with summer. And so many of us, we want to move. You know those snow bunnies, right? They move from place to place because of the culture, because of the climate. That's what a lot of us do spiritually. Oh, it's hot. I'm going to go where it's cold. Oh, it's cold. I'm going to go where it's hot. And we try to avoid the middle. And God is saying, you're going to miss out on Christmas. You're going to miss out on what I have for you because you're not willing to embrace what I have for you. Every other season is determined by your ability to steward the season you're in. Man, Lord, let us grab a hold of the season we're in and help, help those that are in need. God, let us be a blessing to somebody else even when we're in the middle of our mess. I mean, how much, how much more of love is that? How much more is that of the cross? That's all I see when I say that is this, is that the cross. Jesus was so concerned about you and me in the middle of his anguish. He said, God, if this cup can pass from me, let it pass, God. But not my will, God, yours. And I wonder if we're in the middle of this season, this, this, this anguish that's in us, if we could become so much more focused on, on the assignment that God has for us. And thank Jesus that it's not the cross. Thank God that he already paid the price of the cross for you and me. That some of us may have to wait for a little bit. But it's worth the wait. 